Hi, I'm Brian Tima, one of the pastors here at Grace Spring Bible Church. Our prayer is that God use this as an incredible resource to align your heart with His. We know that you're not always able to plug into a local church, but we highly encourage that. Yet we are grateful to be able to offer this resource to you. And if you find that you've been ministered greatly by something that the Ministry of Grace Spring has been doing, feel free to check out our website in ways that you might be able to serve or give. Now let's prepare to hear the Word of God proclaimed. Well, good morning, Grace Spring. Good to see you today. Happy Sunday. Happy heat wave. It's nice out there, right? I don't know if it's going to be sunny yet or not, but it's at least a little bit warmer today. And uh, we're delighted to welcome you to the Gathered Church. In just a few moments, we'll be joining our voices together to praise our King. But before that, I have actually five things that I need to tell you about. By the way, I'm Jim. I'm one of the pastors here and uh, happy to be serving alongside you at Grace Spring. And uh, five uh, just kind of sort of calendar points uh, that we want to blow through this morning so that those are front of mind for you, uh, events that you might want to participate in. First of all, jumpstart your health. You've been hearing a little bit about that over these last couple weeks. It's a program to move you from the couch to a 5K in a matter of, I don't know, eight or nine weeks. And uh, today is the last Sunday where you can sign up, and the ministry counter back in the concourse has more information. There's also information on the web on the events page for all the things we're going to be talking about this morning. Worship night is Wednesday night, the 15th of February, so it's a Wednesday evening, about 10 days away. Right here in this room, just an extended time of prayer and praise, unhurried, and uh, enjoying the Savior together uh, for a time of worship on a Wednesday evening. That's right here on February 15th at 7 o'clock. Two weeks from today, Sunday the 19th, football will be over. And uh, it's the core team training day. We're going to be doing these quarterly uh, here at Gray Spring. If you serve in any way, whether it's family ministry or greeters or facilities or worship or tech, just all the, all the teams of folks that serve here to help make the life of the church happen at Gray Spring, we gather quarterly to have team development and training. There's lunch right after church uh, and then a time to, to share together uh, to unify our hearts in our, in our uh, joint service uh, for the kingdom here. So if you're part of the volunteer volunteer team. That's a day for you after church with lunch and training. Uh, Women's ministry movie night is coming up then nearer nearer to the end of the month. Friday night, the 21st, uh, there's going to be popcorn and cocoa and a movie called Queen Esther uh, for the ladies of Grace Spring. That's coming up in a few weeks as well near the end of the month. Got all those? So the last one I want to talk about is uh, that uh, the affirmation voting for members for our 2023 elder nominees begins today. Uh, There are two uh, gentlemen that have been nominated and vetted and uh, ready to be presented to the congregation. Uh, Bill Witters and John DeVertis are the nominees uh, that we're asking you to consider uh, these next two weeks. Uh, The team is also pursuing a third nominee, and uh, that name will be coming to you, uh, God willing, soon as well, but the full vetting process still needs to be followed uh, for him. So this is for the members of the church and uh, both an opportunity and a responsibility if you're a member of Grace Spring. There's going to be an email set to go out later today to the membership that will have instructions and bios for, uh, for Bill and for John. Also, at the end of the service, there's going to be some elders down front that can answer questions if you have questions and paper bios. And at the hub in the concourse, there's paper bios and more information about the uh, affirmation voting process. So if you're a member of Grace Spring, uh, we'd like to really invite you into that. It's about a two-week window where you can uh, do that affirmation either online or there are paper opportunities available at the hub. Okay? That's a lot. Uh, Now let's uh, turn our attention to the grand purpose of why we gather, and that is to set our eyes towards our Savior. And if you're able to, I want to invite you to stand with me, and uh, let's quiet our hearts before the Lord, and, uh, and I'll pray together as we begin and then as we sing. And would you just take a moment to set aside the cares and the burdens uh, that you carried with you from the parking lot into this space? Set your eyes upon Jesus. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, 
He has caused us to be born again into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. So Father, please now in this time, gather our hearts together and astonish and surprise and delight us once again as we take the precious name of Jesus, your son, on our lips and as we remember our great salvation together. Unite our hearts to both uh, revere you and love you. And you are the one is forever to be glorified, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And we come to you now in the name of our living hope, Jesus Christ. Amen.
sing to the God who saves. We sing to the God who always makes a way. He hung up on that cross, and he rose up from that grave. My God still rolls so joy that's in this house that we can come together and we gather together we can experience that joy but it's not because of what we have done or we have accomplished it's because of what you have accomplished on the cross and so Lord I pray this morning the reality of what you have done for us what you've accomplished for us on the cross the grace you have given us that you have poured out on us will become more reality and we are so grateful and thankful that we can be called children of God, and that is who we are. And so we worship you, we praise you, and we lift up your name. In Jesus' name.
Let's all bow in prayer. Lord God, there's a lyric we just sung that my soul sings your praise. And the truth is there are so many who's having a hard time (laughs) uh, breaking open their soul to praise you right now because maybe there's just a lot of heavy stuff. And so, Father, right now, I pray pray that we will just uh, enable the power of your Holy Spirit. Unleash through the revealed Word of God today to bring freedom that that song just uh, reminded us of. To sing your praise even in the midst of some desert seasons. Father, have your way in our hearts today. In your most holy name, amen. Amen. Please be seated. So great to have you join us. For those of you watching online, I'm so glad um, you've tuned in just to be able to hear what the Holy Spirit of God really wants to say. You know, um, always pray for me as your pastor. I am simply the mailman, the messenger, and I pray that every Sunday I will be able to just get out of the way and that you don't hear from me um, because really my words aren't going to do you much good. But the words of the Lord as revealed in his holy scriptures um, is going to uh, provide the power and the impetus we need um, to really live the godly life that God's word calls you and I to live. Uh, If I could ask a question, and if you could be so vulnerable, um, we like Great Spring to be a vulnerable place, but uh, anyone here find the Christian life to be really, really tough? All right. I'm so glad we got some who are are just going, no, no, pretty easy. You know, I'll tell you, I I just got to be honest with you. Uh, We all go through seasons that are are just really tough. And, uh, you know, I I think when it comes to salvation, you know, sometimes there's some Christian terminology that becomes so familiar to us that we just kind of uh, limit it to uh, the realm of our own surface thinking. But, you know, salvation that we celebrate, uh, the salvation we celebrate is salvation that we just sung about, of what Jesus Christ has done for you that you could never do for yourself, that totally changes your identity, that the righteousness of Jesus Christ has been given to you. Why? So that you could be adopted into the family of faith. That is not anything you have done. It's just you've received that invitation. It's a cooperation with the Holy Spirit of God himself. And that's, that's a wonderful thing. And in that, we have a new identity. But that is um, the justification part of salvation. Last week's sermon, I was talking about the importance of terminology, biblical terminology, that I think so many times the church has gotten lazy. Instead of pressing in, we get a little bit lazy in the terminology. Justification is the first step of salvation, which is um, receiving what Jesus Christ has done. So we are adopted into his family, but now comes the hard work. The hard work is sanctification. The hard work is sanctification. Sanctification is going through the processes that the Holy Spirit leads you into that chisel off everything in you that wants to control your own situation. It's chiseling off everything about you that doesn't look like Jesus, and that hurts. And really what happens is a lot of people uh, really short track the growth that God wants for their life to be able to unleash everything that he has put into your soul. And when you think of the terminology of soul, that is everything that God fashioned in you, the purposes, the giftings he's given you. And he's given all that to you in in your soul. And your soul is what will last for an eternity. And the sanctification process is him continuing to unleash everything that he wants for you. Why? So you can live the most fulfilled life right in alignment with his purposes for you. We want that for all of us. But because life gets tough many times, we just kind of take shortcuts. And that never leads to anywhere really good. But see, what gives us hope through the sanctifying hard work of sanctification (laughs) is the uh, third aspect of salvation that we look forward to with incredible hope, and that is glorification. (laughs) One day, we will have our bodies in the very same way the resurrected Jesus had a glorified body that was fit for 
eternity. Um, you and I who have placed our faith and trust in Jesus Christ will be able to uh, look forward to um, that glorified day. But, but in the meantime, uh, there's a quote. G.K. Chesterton uh, wrote this. He said, Christianity has not been tried out and found wanting. It's been found difficult and not tried. See, there's so many um, that we are reading in the news. It's, it's almost like, man, I, I really thought they had an incredible, incredible walk of faith. But now look, it's almost like they're walking away from faith. What is that? It's because so many times they will not do the hard work. And this is what the Apostle Paul is trying to really uh, teach this still young church in Corinth. I want you to turn your Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 3. 1 Corinthians chapter 3 um, really conflicted as to the title. Months ago when I determined the title, I had to let the walls fall down. Um, yet at the same time, the more I was studying this week, it just, you know, it, it really is just like, I just wanted to say grow up in Christ. Grow up in Christ. That's really what 1 Corinthians 3 is all about. But if you don't have your Bible, we want you to follow along in the Scriptures. There's something powerful when you're reading the text. I think there's something powerful when you're writing things down, you remember it. I write a whole bunch of things in my Bible so that I can pass it on as a legacy to the next generation um, in my family. Um, but 1 Corinthians 3 um, really is a carryover. I, I don't always like chapter breaks in the Bible. Chapter breaks are not inspired by the Word of God. I mean, uh, the, the, the Scriptures are inspired. Chapters and verses are put there by man so that we could uh, find things a little bit easier. But I don't like this chapter break in chapter 3 because it's a carryover. Um, it's, it's, it's a carryover in everything the Apostle Paul is talking about. He's talking about unity. And some things that really deter from unity. Um, we talked about uh, last week uh, the wisdom of natural man. The wisdom of natural man looks for the world um, to uh, come up with the metrics in what a successful life looks like. And the Apostle Paul is saying, no, um, godly wisdom is where life is lived. Godly wisdom. And so we're going to talk through the text. Normally we'll read all the way through the text, but I want you to follow along. On page 1132 in the Bible, under the seat in front of you, if you don't have the Word of God. Um, but the Apostle Paul, again, is writing to a church uh, uh, about four to five years after the Apostle Paul was there 18 months to plant the church, launch the church. Okay, so you're going to read a name by the name of Apollos. He is the one who is the pastor put in charge when Paul left for Ephesus. Okay, so with that, let's talk through this text. Um, but I, brothers, could not address you as spiritual people, but as people of the flesh, as infants in Christ. Man, isn't that encouraging? It's like, oh, wow, right out of the gate. Wow, this is sure great. He says, uh, I fed you with milk, not solid food, for you are not ready for it. And even now you're not ready, for you are still of the flesh. For while there is jealousy and strife among you, are you not of the flesh and behaving only in a human way? For one, one says, I follow Paul, and another, I follow Apollos. Are you not being merely human? Man, I tell you, this is what I love about 1 Corinthians, because he is just saying, hey, uh, l l let's give you a word picture. And so what the Apostle Paul does here is, in the text we're going to read today, there's four word pictures. And I, I appreciate word pictures. The, the very first word picture really in the terminology is, he's basically saying, you're acting like babies. You're acting like babies. I mean, uh, think of a baby uh, in which you are, are familiar with, and they demand that you um, take care of their every need. It's like, wah, okay, I'm dirty, change me. Wah, I'm hungry, feed me. Ah, uh, they've got the toy I want. Yeah, you know, that's how it's working. And what I find very fascinating is when it comes to spiritual maturity, a lot of us have confused what spiritual maturity is. And this is why I have other texts, uh, not just our text 3, 1 through 4 in parentheses, but also I, I have some side texts for you to look at because um, there is this idea of maturity and, and babies and, and what the idea is of growing up. In Philippians chapter 2, uh, 12b and 13. 
it says this. Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who works in you both to will and to work for his good pleasure. I remember having a, a, a first step class and, and uh, sharing with some people really what the biblical expectation is, and that is for us to grow up in the Lord. And I, I had conversation with a ver- variety of people through the years who've said, I've never known, I've never heard that you're supposed to grow up. Grow up looking like what? I mean, uh, I was just taught that you go to church. You go to church and you just kind of do your duty and you leave. I said, no, man, how boring is that? Um, what, what the Apostle Paul is really wanting to challenge um, all of us in is for our souls to grow and for us as a result of the inner transformation happening within because our soul is, is uh, tough, it's resilient, it's enduring. However, there's something true about the soul and that is when the Holy Spirit wants to do something, many times he'll take us through tough terrain and our souls trying to be self-preservationists uh, go into the thick underbrush and as opposed to through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit just saying, hey, let the, 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 the Holy Spirit wants to do something here with that soul. Stop hiding. Let's start addressing why so that we can grow up. Because here, everything in chapter 2 and 3, uh, you know, this is a measuring stick. And, and uh, it, it's really not very, very tall. But what the Apostle Paul is really saying is that if you're following after worldly wisdom, um, this becomes your measuring stick. And how does the world measure maturity? How does the world measure success? How does the world measure it? Man, how, how educated you are. Um, how, uh, what, what kind of paying job do you have? Um, how successful are you? How, how are people perceiving you? Are they, do they perceive you as a success? Okay. And then all of a sudden, really what happens is all of our ambition becomes uh, measuring ourselves on this particular stick, right? And uh, what the Apostle Paul is saying, no, it's really less like this and a little bit more like Man, that God has deposited all kinds of stuff in your soul, and there is incredible capacity. And uh, if you notice anything about the Christian life, you're going to grow, and there's going to be seasons where you're just going to go, wow. And then there's other seasons where it's like, ooh, didn't act the most mature in that situation. But the hope is that through time, you will just grow and grow and grow. That everything that is within your soul is going to continue to be unleashed so that you can live in alignment with the purposes God has for you. And I'll tell you, when you're living that way, there is so much peace. There, it's just absolutely amazing. I told you a little bit about my story last week about how at a young age I, I just really embraced that I'm just going to trust God's word. And even though others will say you're taking it way too seriously, I just said I'm not going. I'm just going to take God's word to be God's word. I'm not going to fight it. And I tell you, it has led to a life that it's just like, yes. I mean, I could take on the hardest situations. And it's like because of just being secure who I am. Now, there's always a battle there, just like there is for you too. I mean, every so often, uh, the, the enemy of God will whisper in my ear, okay, you're not good enough, you don't measure up, and, you, you know, and it's always an identity crisis, and we all go through those. I wish I could tell you, as your pastor, I never go through those. I still go through those. Why? Because even in church world, guess what? This is the measuring stick, Right? How big's your church? How many campuses do you have? How many this? How many that? Whatever. And what happens is you're trying to clamor for that, and then your doing comes at the cost of being with the Lord. You see, see how that works? And we all fall prey to that. But there was, a, uh, a, a, again, a, a movie that really impacted me as a sophomore in high school. So I'm going to age myself here, okay? Um, Chariots of Fire. I, I saw Chariots of Fire probably about three times. The f- only movie I'd seen multiple times. And it was like, oh my goodness. It's the story of Eric Liddell, or Eric Little. And he was born uh, in 1902 to uh, Chinese missionaries. Missionaries, uh, his, his family 
were uh, missionaries to China, and uh, you know, I remember there was a scene in the movie, and what, what Eric Little would do is he was super fast, and uh, he would win all of these uh, races, and and, uh, but his sister was frustrated by him. And for those of us who are old like me, do you remember that scene with his sister up in the mountains? And uh, she was so frustrated because she says, hey, we have a mission to do and all you're doing is running. And he said something like this. In fact, I had to look it up, write it down because I wanted to get it right. Um, he says this. He said, I believe God made me for a purpose, but he also made me fast. And when I run, I feel his pleasure. <laughs> but are you living that way? Uh, you are so convinced that, man, what you were doing, you just feel God's pleasure. Um, what I loved about the movie is that it, it, it contrasted, er, contrasted Eric Liddell with uh, Harold um, Abrams. And Harold Abrams... He, he ran for himself. So there was a contrast. One was running out of the delight of relationship with the living God. And the other was running for the delight of himself and how he would be perceived by others. Because that would determine how he viewed himself. And his line in the movie, that it was right before the Olympics. Right before he was, uh, an hour before he was running. And he says, in one hour's time, I will raise my eyes, look down the corridor with 10 lonely seconds to justify my existence. Man, how just like, ugh. Because here's what happens. You lose the race and you're out of it. You lose the race and your identity's lost. But with Eric Liddell, man, he could even say, yes, I'm in the Olympics, but I am not going to run on Sunday because of my convictions, and the Olympic Committee switched some things around, and he still ran, and he won, and, and it was just like, as a sophomore in high school, I said, I want that. I want Eric Liddell. I don't want Abram's story for me. I want, Eric, man, and God uses these tools to help grow us up. But here is the point when it comes to spiritual maturity. And I think this is a, going to be an aha moment for some, if not many. Is that spiritual maturity is most clearly seen not in what we know, but in how we treat one another. Because I want you to think, as we have been going through the book of 1 Corinthians... There is a lot in these chapters. Man, we're going to cover some really heavy stuff coming up. But what is so fascinating is out of the gate, the Apostle Paul, after making a point about the gospel and how we are to function from our identity and uh, our calling and our mission is all from our identity, he is going to go after this division that is happening within the church of Jesus Christ. I mean, there is this division. So... He is likening spiritual immaturity for you, how you are acting with one another. He said jealousy. Jealousy is an attitude. It's a baby attitude. It's I want what they got, and I'm going to whine until I get what they got. That's jealousy. That's an attitude, and it leads to strife. Well, they got it, so I'm ticked at them. And so the Apostle Paul is saying unity is so important in the church because the world is looking within. And if you've got crazy things happening between brothers and sisters in the Lord that is so willful and divisive, he says that is very, very, very immature. In fact, um, what he's basically saying is when Christians fight, something is not right. Now, you can have disagreements. That's fine. However, when there's this long-standing willingness to say, I hate you, I don't want anything to do with you, and all that kind of stuff, the Apostle Paul is saying, uh, here, have a baby rattle because you're acting like a baby. Is really what he's saying. I'm, what I love about Paul is he just shoots straight, doesn't he? And so with that, he is just talking about when he says you're still of the flesh, he says this, you are measuring how the world measures. You are not measuring how Christ measures. Christ is wanting everything from the inside to come out and for you to grow up. Amen? Let's look and continue reading. Because uh, uh, verse 4 kind of uh, brings up kind of really what was the root of some of the problem. He says... Uh, 
you know, I follow Apollos, and some says I follow Paul, but verse 5 says, what then is Apollos? What is Paul? Servants through whom you believed as the Lord assigned to each. He says, I planted, meaning I planted the church. God used me to plant the church. Um, but then Apollos watered. But is that anything? Yes, that's being faithful to the task. But who is it that did the growing? Who is it that caused the growth? But God gave the growth. And then this is the humility, the, the humbling part. I was going to say humiliating part, but it could be that too. So neither he who plants nor he who waters is anything, but only God who gives the growth. Isn't that incredible? He says, it's just like we're servants of God. That's it. There's nothing to boast in. All we are is being faithful in what God has deposited in. God has given me gifts. God has given you gifts. I'm just using my gifts, however I can encourage and admonish. But in the very same way, God's given you gifts. But at the end of the day, it's like, you know, verse 8 says, He who plants and he who waters are one, and each will receive wages according to his labor. For we are God's fellow workers. You are God's field, God's building, which is going to take us to the next point. So in the meantime, though, there's this farming, this, this growth terminology. And really what he's saying here, the point he's saying here in this paragraph we just read is our primary loyalty is to Christ. Loyalties to other must, others must follow. You agree with that? Now, again, I encourage everybody, don't trust what I say, trust what the scriptures say, okay? So, I'm just saying, as I prayed through, read through all of that, coming up with the points, it's just what we cannot emphasize enough, and that is our loyalty is to Christ. So much division happens when our loyalty becomes to people, and that causes all kinds of separation all over the place. And then we fight battles for people, and we go, oh, they weren't right. And so then all of a sudden, now we do their battles for them and all that. And it's like, man, battle away. But here's the truth, that is God glorified in that? Is God glorified in that? No, man, you could be angry, but it says be angry and do not sin. How do you make it sin? By letting bitterness get so enrooted that that root goes down and it produces a really ugly tree. And that tree extends branches into so many areas of life. And we see it and tragically in the church, it's so tolerated so many times. But again, Philippians, uh, one six says this, I am sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. He says, I am sure of this. I am sure of this. It's Christ who's doing that. So there's certain things in the Christian walk that only God can do, and there are certain things in the Christian walk that you must choose to do in cooperation. What has Christ done that you cannot do? <laughs> he paid the penalty for your sin. That's the gospel. That's like the ultimate of what he could do. That only he could do that. Only he could forgive sin. Only he could adopt you into your eternal family, giving you an eternal inheritance. Only he could do that. But now what we can do is we could choose to now live in our new identity. And in living in our new identity, the, Paul is so clear here that maturity is how we treat one another, how we treat one another. And it's an extension of our love for the Lord that will extend. And so the forgiveness we receive from him, we are able to impart to other people. And when you aren't able to extend forgiveness, then you are, I, I'm telling you, you are forgetting how much forgiveness was extended to you. And I know so many times I'm inclined to, in that statement, compare myself with other people who aren't doing as well as I am. <laughs> but uh, we're always to measure against the authority of the Word of God. So always know this, and this is what is so tough to be a pastor in American church today. Because everything is about who's my pastor, who do I follow, COVID now, I can't tell you how many different ones that I get forwarded, here, you got to watch this YouTube, and oh, here, you got to do this, which is code for you need to really uh, hold the convictions this one does and preach just like them, or you really need to, man, I'll tell you, there's stuff all over the place. 
but COVID has really gotten people to have a whole lot more inputs into our lives. And I'll tell you, whatever you want to hear, you will always be able to find on YouTube. Always, always, always. No matter what opinion, trust me. Um, but that's why we don't follow men or women. We follow Christ. Okay. Third. Now, here's a, a building illustration here in our text. Going on, verse 10, according to the grace of God given to me, like a skilled master builder, I laid a foundation and someone else is building upon it. Let each one take care how he builds upon it, for no one could lay a foundation other than that which is laid, which is Christ, Jesus Christ. Now, if anyone builds on the foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, straw, each one's work will become manifest for the day will disclose it because it will be revealed by fire and the fire will test what sort of work each one has done. If the work that anyone has built on the foundation sur survives, he will receive reward. If anyone's work is burned up, he will suffer loss, though he himself will be saved, but only through the fire. This particular paragraph, the more I've been pressing in and studying it, the more I keep seeing this as an admonishment to the leaders of churches to be careful what you're building. Be careful what you're building. Be careful what you're building. We just finished a weekend with our elders, and I'll tell you, it's just a great retreat with them all weekend at, at Go Lake Ministries, and, and it was just a great time of seeking the Lord together and really acknowledging that, hey, as elders, man, what are some tweaks we need to make? What are some tweaks we need to make for the health and ultimate for the leading of this church family? And I'm excited about what we put in place, and you'll hear more about it. But I firmly believe when it comes to elders, when it comes to staff, um, I believe firmly what we do is more important than what's going to happen um, here next week, and that's the Super Bowl, right? I, what we do is more important than the Super Bowl. And uh, it is our job to equip, encourage, admonish, train up. It is our job as staff to do that. And, and I firmly believe, you know, as I've read through this text through the years, I've always go, oh, well, okay, here's the Bema Seat Judgment. And, you know, everything you build, you know, rocks, rock, you know, precious stones, when dried by fire, they become more brilliant. But wood, hay, and straw, they all burn up, don't they? But, you know, at least you're saved, but barely through the flames if your faith is in Jesus Christ. But I tell you, it really took on a new look when I was really pressing into the context of this and really going, you know, I, I just I really feel like that is an admonishment to the church leaders, to even Apollos himself, to say, hey, guy, you need to make sure that everything that you're training and equipping is building up. And if there is this willing dissension and you are you were just having your ego stroked because you're so jazzed how many people in your congregation say how much better you are than Paul or even Peter. Um, he says, no, no, here we go. That is wood, hay, straw stuff. We have got to keep it to the gospel. We've got to grow people up and allow the flexibility and will willingness of how God has deposited the capacity in each one's soul to grow and develop how God has designed them to grow and develop. Amen? So the point of this paragraph is God is the ultimate judge of church leadership, not you. Oh, wow. Wow, isn't that great? No, hey, trust me. I do not have a bone to pick, okay? I do not feel like we got people divisive and doing all this kind of stuff. I'm just saying in Western culture, Western Christian culture, it is very popular to do this. And it breaks my heart. It breaks my heart when I hear that people have left Grace Spring for another church which happens, okay? You know, sometimes God leads you to do that. But don't diss me at the grocery store because now I represent the uh, competing church. No, no, there's no room for that. No room for that. I just encourage you, if you leave, leave quietly. <laughs> but even if some people are here and you are another church, they leave quietly. Don't create dissension. It is a real problem leading to our last point because I, I tell you, we live in a day where people are so doggone proud of what church they go to. And I think that's got to stop. 
I think we can be excited that, hey, God's doing a great thing here. It's like, praise God. But God's doing a great thing down the street. God's doing a great thing in this region. God's doing a great thing. We just get to be a part of what God's doing here. And, and, and we celebrate that. It's not competition in the body of, faith, of, of Christ. It is we on the same team that are, how do we encourage one another? And yes, if God is leading you into another church, great. Let's still have friendship. <laughs> it's not like, oh, here we go. Now we got to stop friendship. That happens all the time. And uh, anyway, enough of that. Continuing on. Um, but do you not know that you are God's temple? Okay, I want to stop right there. Because the you is plural. The you is not a person you. It's hugely important. Because the verses I'm about to read are the verses that throughout the years, church leadership has said, if somebody commits suicide, they're going to an eternal hell. This is the verses they say that, and I'm out to tell you why that is not the case. Okay? Do you know not... No, do you not know that you, plural, are God's temple and that God's spirit dwells in you? If anyone destroys God's temple, God will destroy him for God's temple is holy and you are the temple. Okay. Now, at first reading in English, again, it's just like, oh, yeah. I mean, where, who is the temple? You know, we are the temple. Where does the Holy Spirit dwell? In us. Yes, but if Paul was intending to talk about you, he would not use the plural you. See, I could say, hey, you guys come with me. Now, that can mean plural or, or, or individual in the English, but the Greek won't let you do that. <laughs> the Greek will say, no, this is a plural you. He's talking about y'all. Again, here's the point he is making that the temple... The temple, the temple is the church of Jesus Christ. The temple, we are together. Yes, there's a personal aspect to it. Paul's going to address that later. But here he's talking first about the collective local church body. That's you and I. Okay? And with that, um, you know, there's these other scriptures that I think we, we need to understand that this, again, is Paul contending for unity. And who is the bride of Christ? Who is the bride of Christ? The church. The capital C church is the bride of Christ. Okay? And the very same way you diss my wife, you diss me, right? How popular is it in church world to diss the church? Or even people within a church love to make it their ambition to stir things up within the church and create division. That's the one Paul says, you better watch out because you are messing with the bride of Christ. You better watch out. Again, I'm not saying this because I had a bone to pick. I'm just saying this because we are to contribute to church health, not deter from it. We are to contribute to church health in the giving of our time, our talent, and our treasure. Sometimes it's so awkward. Sometimes at the end of service, it's like, oh, yeah, offering. Yeah, we got to mention the offering. If we don't mention offering, people don't remember it, all that stuff. The truth is you need to prioritize how are you giving your time, your talent, your treasure, because this is a body. Body is membership. Body is partnership. Body, body, body is body life. We are living organism, church. We're not an organization. We are an organism, and our head is Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. All right. So um, all of this is setting us up for a time of communion, which I think is going to be beautiful and hugely uh, a, a great expression. But you need to know there's a few of us, myself, Anita Olula, um, our outreach uh, director, um, Steve Dorlag, you know, we are heading out to uh, uh, Jordan and Lebanon on Saturday. And we're going to go, uh, Anita's going to share a little bit more about what we're doing, but here is what we want to see, that we're going to a part of the world that is very, very tough, and the church needs a lot of encouragement, but also here's what always happens. You go to a place like that, and you leave far more encouraged than the encouragement you were intending to give, because there's just so much that will go on. So we'll cover your prayers on that, but the church in any geographical context is about the same thing, that we are a people brought together by the Spirit of God 
um, union and union together with uh, the body of Christ and we have the opportunity to contribute to church health so that when you give even in the offering when you give it's supporting the kinds of things that we do that you don't even know about one of those things is uh, you know there's a whole bunch of things over here at the table that numerous ones of us have have, have made that we are going to take as gifts um, to these churches that we're visiting in very, again, difficult part of the world, that when they go to church, it could be their last day going to church. You just never know. But the church is united under Jesus Christ. And uh, I, I tell you, I, I hope you are hearing from this the importance it is that Paul is saying we got to contend for unity. So maturity isn't how much you know. <laughs> maturity is how, how well are you treating one another. I mean, really treating one another. Are you bringing the gospel into your relationships? Is that impacting the way you are loving other people? I'll tell you, I, I believe that is why God is doing a great thing here because we, are, we have more and more people just so committed to saying, I want to grow deeper in my walk with the Lord. I want a biblical worldview. I mean, Matt Hennessy's class, I mean, is like, what, 100 people, you know, second service, you know. I mean, of, of those that just says, we want a biblical worldview. You know, there's a lot going on here that people say, I want to go deeper in the Word because it's going to help us sustain and be able to thrive in the times we're in, not just barely survive in the times we're in. I, I want to thrive, not survive. Thriving is far better than just merely surviving. And we can thrive because of the cross of Jesus Christ. So I want us in preparation before I ask uh, Pastor Jim Mitchell up here to lead us in a time of communion. Um, I just want, I, I, I think, you know, it's interesting that Paul wrote this letter from Ephesus, but that he was later going to write this letter to the Ephesian church. And he says this, walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called with all humility and gentleness with patience, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. When you have that humility, you have that patience, you have that gentleness, you not only find yourself growing and growing and growing, but you are helping somebody else grow and untap the soul that God has deposited with them to do things that will last for an eternity. Amen? Good. Um, Pastor Mitchell, come on up here. And uh, there's a, a team of folks that's uh, beginning to gather uh, to get the elements. And uh, in a moment, we'll be serving uh, to us. We're going to, as a church family, receive the bread and the cup right where you sit. And then if you would uh, hold on to those, and we're going to take time to eat together and then to drink together as I'll lead us. If you happen to be somebody that needs uh, gluten-free bread, if you just slip your hands up and uh, slip a hand up, and one of the servers will see you and bring you uh, the gluten-free bread uh, so that you can have that supplied to you as well. You know, communion is one of the most poignant pictures that our Lord has given us uh, in, in both remembering what he has done for us, but also remembering what Brian was just talking about, our unity and our oneness. That passage in Ephesians that he just ended with uh, speaks of there's one faith, one Lord, one baptism, one body, right? Team, you can go ahead and start serving as well. There is uh, there's a, a passage just seven chapters later uh, from where we've been now in chapter 3 of this letter to the Corinthians where Paul begins to talk about communion. And with the church there in Corinth, all the yuck that, that Brian keeps referring to of the disunity and the being of babies and the, the fighting among each other, Paul begins to talk about the Lord's table, the bread and the cup, and starts to, to tell them, you cannot participate in the body and the blood of Christ like this with hearts that are divided because this is a picture of who we are unified as one body, one temple in Christ. As you receive the elements, let me just invite you to a moment of quiet 
and then I'll read over uh, you from the, the letter to the Corinthians before we eat. Would you just quiet your hearts and let the words from uh, Pastor Brian's message and the remembrance of Jesus wash over you. And so Paul would write to the Corinthians later in chapter 10, the cup of blessing that we bless, is it not a participation in the blood of Christ? The bread that we break, is it not a participation in the body of Christ? Because there is one loaf, and we who are many are one body, for we all partake of the one loaf. When we uh, p- pass the bread out, we're, uh, we're dealing with something that's already been broken and assembled for us uh, uh, to use. It's just practical. But the picture that Paul and, and Jesus want us to have in our minds is this all comes from a single loaf. And we are many diverse people, but because we all partake of the single loaf, who is Jesus, the bread of life? We are united together as one body. And every time that we do this, we are doing it as an expression of our unity and our oneness. Because there is one loaf, the Lord Jesus Christ, who is the bread of life that has come down from heaven. It is not a time for me to remember Jesus. It is a time for we to remember Jesus. Just like that, you is plural, not singular. And this is our time together as the bride to revel in the bridegroom and as the body to look to our head and in our oneness celebrate that out of one loaf we have been gathered together, the many and the diverse, to become one body because Jesus has borne in his body on the tree our sins. Do you believe that together, church? And so in unity, let us eat the bread and remember our Savior Jesus. And you hold in your hand also the cup. And the cup is a remembrance of the precious blood of Jesus Christ with which we have been purchased. In the book of Hebrews, uh, the author there talks about Jesus as the perfect and great high priest. And different than all the priests before who year after year after year have to keep sacrificing over and over and over again, he went into the true and real temple that's in heaven not the one on earth that's just a picture of the real one. And there he sprinkled his own blood. He entered by means of his own blood, not sacrifice of animals that only is a, is a temporary covering, but a once for all sacrifice with his own blood. And so that what he accomplished was an eternal redemption. And that's why from the cross he said, it is finished. Once for all, never to be paid again, payment in full by his blood. And that's what we remember as we, again, in unity, drink the cup together. If you're able to, can I invite you to please stand without spilling the juice (laughs) and prepare to drink together in unity. And would you say with me aloud uh, these words? Repeat after me. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. It is finished. Let's drink together. Cheers.
Jesus, our Savior, we are grateful people. Thank you for bearing the awful weight of the Father's judgment of the sin of the entire world throughout all time, including ours. And thank you for binding us together in one body to be your people. We love you. And hear now the voice of our praises as we continue to worship you together.
morning you can have a seat so in Jordan right now more than a third of their country are refugees in Lebanon the, their dollar is devaluated by 90 percent their heat costs their food the basics of life are at 400 percent higher than it was a while ago they get their weed and heat from Ukraine and Russia it's rough here in the States, we have our own difficulties. We have families who have lost a loved one through death. We have families who are split through different reasons. And we have people who are suffering major illnesses. So I have three people go to Jordan and Lebanon right now. Let's just send money. You know, sometimes money is good, and sometimes we need to come alongside the church together to hear their stories, to see how God is working in the midst of impossible circumstances, and to be able to see how they're reaching out to children who need hope, to families who feel very separated, to reach out to the husbands or wives who are the primary caregivers or providers and know that they have lower resources. So we three are going, to um, Brian Tima, Scott Dorleg, and myself, However, there's more than three of us going. This entire local church body is sending us. And so everyone in this room, whether you are remembering to pray for us, who've made some items for us to take to show we are part of the church together, to let us be able to encourage them and to bear witness of how God is working throughout the world so that we might be encouraged, not just here for being able to send a team, but for the team to be able to hear and report back to you, for we are all important in this endeavor. And so as Steve Dorleg and uh, Brian Tima come up, I just want to read, if I, if I didn't lose it in my phone. I'm jumping ahead to later in uh, uh, Corinthians. First Corinthians 12, 25, 26, that there be no division in the body, but that all members may have the same care for one another. If one member suffers, all suffer together. If one member is honored, all rejoice together. So I'd like you all to stand up because you are all part of this team and we'll be having Mark Jevert pray for us. 
If you've been at Grace Spring for a while, sometimes you know we uh, extend our arm as we pray for somebody. And if you're comfortable doing that, I'd encourage you to do that for Anita, for Steve, and for Pastor Brian. God, thank you for the opportunity to be a blessing, to come alongside, to see how you are at work in the midst of such struggle. For us to learn that maybe someday it might be our circumstances that are under that kind of struggle for our faith. Lord, we ask for protection. We ask for a, just a spirit of uh, encouragement and service as uh, these three who represent us as a body come alongside our friends in Jordan and Lebanon. Thank you for what you're doing in that uh, part of the world and for the blessing we've already had in being a financial partner and a prayer partner. Um, may we learn much from this. May you be glorified. Thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Hey, thank you, church. And before we close, I just want to remind you of a couple of things. One is, uh, this is never a church that we want you to sprint out to the parking lot, man. We want you to huddle up, talk with people, pray with one another. We have elders that would always love to pray with you up here near the cross. But also, remember, we have uh, two uh, elders that we uh, need your approval on. Uh, their bios are available. If you have any questions for elders or any one of them, feel free to come up here at the end of service and we could get any questions answered that you might have. Um, but also, if you are here for the first time, I've never had the opportunity to meet you. Please come up. Uh, I'd love to introduce myself and please introduce yourself to me. But in the meantime, you guys have an incredible week. Love you. And I know for me, I'll see you in a couple of weeks, but it's going to be, uh, we cover your prayers. So thank you so much. Love you guys. Amen.